concerned about that causes that has caused us to develop these programs which would be much more effective at solving the problems of those people that they're concerned about. And of course with the liberals, liberals another thing you have to recognize is they, they don't know anything about economics. And that's a broad generalization, of course. But you must assume that they have absolutely no knowledge of free market economics. And you, you have to, to uh, you're going to have to teach them something. Now on the other hand, we have the conservatives your general conservative type of uh, uh, audience, you know, your local business person. Well, there's a, we have the, the uh, traditional religious heritage of our country, which is largely at the base of the conservative mind, the Puritan ethic, the work ethic, which tells them that if they are successful, then that's is an indication of virtue, that they have done right in God's scheme of things, which is, you know, perfectly okay. They're obviously, or for the most part, they're the people who want the victim, victimless crime laws. They want to keep people from uh, eating and drinking and smoking and making love and that sort of thing uh, in these ways that they don't approve of. And it's all tied up in, in uh, religious stuff. Uh, that's not all of them. You also have the, the secular free enterpriser and the constitutionalists, which again, they sort of have these commitments which are almost religious. That is, you know, the Constitution and the Bible were written by the same guys, basically. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, as we know, they're, they're largely very hawkish in foreign policy. They want to nuke atheistic communism. Um, I'm Again, speaking very broad generalities, but these are the, you have to go into these groups and talking with these groups with some sort of expectation about their mindset in these broad areas. Our program, of course, we're saying, again, we're right in there with them. You know, God and Jesus are liber libertarians. Damn right. Uh, in... Yeah, God and Jesus. <laughs> the the point the point that I'm making is that the that freedom is a necessary condition for people to exercise moral virtue. That if we coerce them and, and put a straitjacket on them, they will not have the ability to exercise their free will and then have judgment made on them. They won't have the opportunity to reach their heaven or their hell. I mean, even if, even if one is not religious, you are, it is possible to speak to people who are religious in their terms. Leave sin, the subject of sin, you know, prostitution or smoking dope or whatever they, this particular group of conservatives thinks is sinful. Leave that to the individual and his God. And, not, and don't have the government get involved in it. We can also talk about the great principle of separation of church and state, which constitutionalists are very, that's big First Amendment stuff. We can talk about victimless cri crimes as free enterprise. Again, I mentioned that before. <clears throat> we can also explain, because they are free enterprise and they do know free, uh, free market e economics, we can show them how the attempts to suppress activities that people want to in, engage in, such as, uh, say, homosexuality or smoking dope, that the cost of attempting to suppress it are simply too high. They relate to those economic analyses, and they will buy them. And, of course, in speaking about in the foreign policy and national defense area, again, we can talk about free enterprise, uh, self-determination, getting out of the United Nations, the whole, the, the international financial uh, bankers that they're all, that conservatives are largely worried about, who get this, who are really into the pockets of the taxpayers subsidizing uh, these uh, uh, people who are involved in, in international, uh, the international banking, the Trilateral Commission and that sort of thing, uh, the Rockefeller Axis, whatever you want to call it. So you see, 
What I'm really saying is, with if you break the world of non-libertarians up into those who consider themselves as sort of liberal and those who consider themselves as sort of conservative, there are ways of talking to both of them to make them feel comfortable with you and to make them see that the libertarian approach and analysis and program really them more of what they want, really addresses their concerns more effectively than the people who uh, claim to be leader, liberal political leaders or conservative political leaders, because we can demonstrate that their policies have really been uh, not nearly as, as good. Now, <clears throat> Uh, let me skip over it. Uh, okay, let me see this, which are, uh, I think, very prevalent types of problems that, that pop up and give you some examples in communicating with people. I mentioned egalitarianism as a, uh, an underlying premise of much of liberal thought. Uh, it's, it's important to, to recognize that. Uh, but another premise of other underlying premises that appear in most asked by people or most challenges to return and is this premise, which is the, the people are no good premise, paying premise. As people are either too stupid or basically bad to be allowed freedom because if I act like this, and the questioner does like that, like that. Now, by identifying the fallacious premise underneath and, and bringing it out in the open and challenging that, the, raising that as an issue as to whether or not people really are bad, and even if they are, isn't it still better to have respect for their rights to make their own decisions and, and, and their own mistakes? Uh, I think it's helpful to, to, to understand that, one, there you, quite often you will run into that underlying premise. The other, and particularly, that people are, are dumb. That is, well, gee whiz, if the government didn't provide libraries or streets or schools or whatever, whatever in the world would happen? Now, the underlying premise is people are, if suddenly all the people in government who are providing a particular service is out of hell with it and walked away, what would all of those people who have been receiving that service and thought it was important and valuable to have it do? They'd say, hey, what's going to happen? And what are a bunch of greedy capitalists going to come around and say, ha ha, I want to buy that service from me? People are not dumb, but that's a premise that underlies it. Another common premise, mistaken, of course, underlying many questions, is that there's a free lunch. That is, well, or you, you see that in terms of free schools, free medical care. People make the assumption that if the government's providing it, then it's not costing anything. And it's very important to say, well, wait a minute, we're paying a whole lot of money for that now. People say, well, gee whiz, you know, the poor people couldn't afford it uh, if, you took, if the government weren't providing it free. Well, one obvious thing to say is that the money and the wealth is coming from somewhere and going into somebody's pockets to do that. Another common fallacy is that laws work. You say, oh, my goodness, we can't, we can't decriminalize marijuana because then if we did that, people would smoke it. Oh, <laughs> you mean the laws work now? Uh, you'd be amazed at the number of issues and questions that are raised where there's a built-in assumption that the laws that are presently on the books that don't work worth a damn uh, are the ones that we're talking about. And their argument is, oh, well, we have to have those laws because otherwise people would do the thing that those laws are designed to prevent. And the whole, all the problems that we have are, are because... Uh, not, not just because, but uh, uh, many of the problems and the, the concerns that these people have who are raising the questions is because the, the laws that are already there are, uh, do not work. Um, another one, which is uh, one of my favorites, is the utopian straw man, which goes something like this, where a person analyzes what you're saying and says, well, I perceive that if you... If the libertarian program were pretty much implemented, that it wouldn't be a perfect world. That is, some people would break the rules 
you couldn't you cannot guarantee me that everybody would be well fed and happy and uh, nobody would ever do anything wrong therefore there must be something wrong with your program and I reject it entirely I think you've all had that experience in talking to something like that and what they're doing is saying the standard the test I'm applying is utopia and if you can't meet utopia to hell you and the point to make is utopia isn't one of the choices the choices are between the kind of regulated uh, fascist or communist or whatever type of society we have now and the kinds of programs and policies that are uh, in that the Democrats and Republicans have uh, implemented and are going to continue to implement and a freer society those are your choices uh, another manifestation of the, I think the same kind of fallacy is the guy who says well I agree with you on everything except this over here so to hell with it well how much of the Democrat program do you, you agree with oh about 30 percent um, but I guess they're better because you know uh, they haven't killed me yet or something no it's, it's very funny you uh, and this all must be done in a in a, in a I think a, a humorous and and uh, um, with goodwill to point out that's really an interesting position you're taking you're saying you agree with us almost 100% you disagree with them about 50-50 therefore you're going to stick with them uh, I have a little trouble with that uh, I think I would go the other way uh, what do you think uh, there are again there are ways of of pointing out the the silliness of most traditional political an analyses and positions that take place or that, that people hold in a way that really makes you come across as someone who has who shares the concerns that that person has uh, and who has thought about it thought about those concerns pretty thoroughly and has come up with some alternatives which are probably going to be beneficial for that person if indeed they're given a chance to operate and this goes back to the fundamental sort of short sentence statement of the libertarian position which is we operate on the basis of respect for other people's for all people's rights to do what they want to with their lives and if if we as libertarians build in you know, internalize that concept about ourselves and about them they're not really a bunch of dummies and they're not really a bunch of mean evil people and that those conservatives aren't a bunch of evil people and those liberals aren't a bunch of evil people what they all are is really libertarians like us and we're just kind of help them, helping them discover it so that they can come along in the direction that, uh, that we think is going to be valuable uh, across the board for all of us that is the creation of a free society uh, to that point now having made that general statement or indication of a general approach let me warn you <laughs> that knowing a broad principle knowing a principle which is true is certainly not enough to know how to apply it to specific situations it takes practice it takes study people want to know how would it work give me an example has it ever been that way anywhere before uh, most of what people quote know close quote about particularly economic history and social history is just flat wrong what they learned in their history books and by osmosis through television and newspapers and things like that is just plain in error factually you have to know the right stuff it means that you have to work at it but you have the advantage I think of being motivated because you too want to live in a free society it's important that you learn this stuff and it's important that we communicate it effectively to all of those other libertarians out there who have just been waiting for us to come along thank you I think I may have time for about one or two questions before uh, we have to vacate the room. Uh, yours is too long. I know what yours is. Okay. Uh, my experience is that 
a lot of people I've talked to have an underlying fear of some power group, whatever that group might be. It might be labor union leaders, it might be the International Monetary Society. I'll repeat the question. I, I don't think you touched on how you communicate with people who have a basic fear of technology, whichever is already in my Okay. Um, the question was, a lot of people have uh, a sort of an idea that there are big groups, whether they're labor unions or the Trilateral Commission, the international <laughs> bankers, uh, like this one, uh, this is the one you'll love. Um, I watched Jerry Brown do this. This phrase, the big multinational oil corporations. Ooh. They just terrify the hell out of everybody. All you have to do is say those words. I, uh, what, as some of you have probably been watching the Milton Freedom, Friedman things. You know, I watched, uh, was it Michael Harrington? An entire argument that he made was, th was this. The big corporations. <laughs> now, obviously... Everybody, he knew that all he had to do was say the big corporations raise his eyebrow and nod his head once. And everybody knew what he was talking about. And everybody knew he was talking about evil. Uh, okay. Now, you see, he is relying on something, on what he, what he perceives to be the set of mind or a set of assumptions that is in the mind of the general public. And he may not be too far off on that particular point. So there is, as you say, Bob, an underlying fear of the power of some kind of group. The response is that, or part of the response, is, yeah, yeah, we're concerned about that too. That's one of the things that we really want to uh, deal with. Now, see, what have, I, what have I done when I answered the question that way? What I've said is, I share your concern, Mr. Questioner. I am concerned about that too, and I have given it some thought. And I said, hey, this guy must be all right. He's given thought to the same things I'm concerned about. Um, the point is that the kind of power that you are concerned about is a, is a legitimate concern, but that power derives from favors that government can give. That is, the development of the kind of power and the exercise of power, power is one of those buzzwords that you really ought to talk about defining, but I don't have time right now. The kind of power that we really ought to be concerned about is the power that government grants to prevent, uh, to, to assist these groups to prevent competition, basically, in the marketplace. That is, subsidies to big business, subsidies to, say, the international bankers. And then you give some examples. For instance, the Panama Canal Treaty situation was largely for the benefit of the big international bankers who have loans outstanding to Panama, which now the, the American taxpayers are really in the position of guaranteeing by the way that they set up that treaty. So what we do is we switch. The bad guy is the government. And we, we've taken where we said, you have a legitimate concern, and the reason that you, uh, you really ought to have concern, and it is legitimate, is because of what the government has done. We want, we as libertarians, have a program where we eliminate those favors, we eliminate that power that government can grant to those groups, as ill-defined as they may be, uh, and reduce the risk that they can do something bad to us. Okay? One more. If, if liberals are committed to the egalitarianism of guilt, how No, I don't think that's true. I think that any emotion is susceptible to a reasoned appeal because every emotion is really the result of this sort of psychological sort of analysis. Every emotion that one has is a result of some data taken in and some, some principles about the way the world works and the way human nature acts that the person has internalized. So if, in fact, you can articulate for that person the basis of his thinking and why he has this guilt uh, or why he has a position on a particular issue which may be uh, motivated in some substantial part by guilt, you're helping him to understand himself. And if you do that, 
Then again, his response is, hey, this guy really understands me. He understands what my thinking is about. He understands my concerns. And you deal with the thing that, that the person is concerned about. And you, you point, what you point out is that that's a legitimate concern. And we're concerned about that too. And we have thought about it. We think that our program for trying to solve the kinds of problems for those people that you're concerned about, and if we always want to put it on the human basis, I am concerned about him, not, you know, we and them, or the government and the corporations. Personalize it, personalize it, personalize it. One-on-one -on -one is better. So that you, the reasoned appeal uh, is really an analytical sort of a thing that one does, which really is, again, getting the message that I not only share the concerns that you have, but I have thought about them, and I can give some reasons for them, and I think I can show you that the libertarian program will really get you where you want to go in a more effective way than the, than the messy, inefficient way that government has done it. Okay, we have to vacate the room. I thank you all for your attention. Time and finish on time. So I'll